Well, good morning and welcome to The Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor, and I think I just got saved during the announcements. Holy smokes. Um, If you're listening to the podcast and you missed the announcements, you need to go find this Sunday, and you need to watch them because Pastor Robbie just brought it. Listen, we're so passionate about community. I hope you can hear that in, in, in our voices and in the way we speak. We just mean it. We really, really, really want you to encounter Jesus and to be in a real life-giving community. And so next Sunday, you guys, next Sunday, after all these weeks of being here in live in the studio, coming to you online, uh, and you know what? We're so grateful for the technology, for the opportunity to be able to worship together online. But listen to me, there is nothing like being in the room. There is nothing like being in the room. It's no substitute to worship alone when you could be together with the people of God and the family of God and to be surrounded by the voices of His people united in worship together to be able to see the people who are willing and ready to invest in and take part in your life, to make the connections, the relationships, to have our kids invested in. I'm just telling you, there is nothing like being in the room and people gathering church, it is time. It is time. It is time for us to get back in the room. It's time for us to be together again. It it has been too long. And so next Sunday, February 21st, we are back live and in person at the Reuters Family YMCA. uh, And we can't wait to celebrate our fifth birthday with you. Our church it will be celebrating five years next Sunday. In fact, it's exactly five years. We launched February 21st, 2016, and so much has happened since then. I was just thinking that five years really isn't that long of a period of time. We are still uh, a kindergarten church, you know. We're still so young, and yet God has done so, so much in just five years. Next Sunday, I've got a message prepared for you that is really from my heart. I've got some new vision to share with you. Uh, you know, I, I really just want to—I want to talk about where we are right now and where we are going. Because I'll be honest, that as a pastor for the last year, it's felt a lot like uh, we've been in foxholes. You know, uh, that we've been bracing ourselves for one attack after the other, and and just trying to keep the ground that we have rather than taking ground. But that's not the way that I'm built. I'm built to take hills. I'm I'm built to go forward. I'm I'm built to take ground, and I know that you are too. And so next week, we're going to be talking about our next hills that we're taking and and the ground that we're going to be taking in Jesus' name and the ways that we're going to be moving forward. We're done waiting on the sidelines. We're done sitting in foxholes. We are ready to move forward and retake this city in the name of Jesus. I hope that you'll be a part of it. We're doing everything that we can still uh, to protect you and to keep us safe during this pandemic and this season that we're in. You know, we're checking temps at the doors. We require a mask at all times. We're socially distancing in our space. We've set our chairs apart. We've done everything that we can think of to make sure that it's as safe as going to the grocery store for you. You know, we just really believe that this is one of the most important things you can do with your week is come together to worship on Sunday and to be in a life group where you can find freedom. And so I just want to encourage you... um, it's time. It's time to step into community and to step into uh, being a part of the family of God and the body of Christ. And so uh, I'm so, so excited about next week, and I hope that you'll join us. We've got a special gift for you uh, to celebrate our fifth anniversary. Uh, Robert said it was a secret, but we're getting hats for everybody. Awesome hats. You're going to love them. And uh, Gathering Church hats, There's only they're there until they're gone, and you can only get them by coming in person next week. And these hats are great. You want to get one and celebrate with us. It's really, it's going to be a great day. I hope that you come. I hope that you're there. It, it is time. You need this. You need 
this. And so we'll see you there. Well, today we're wrapping up a series called Under Pressure. Under Pressure has been the series we've been in because we've been talking about pressure because pressure reveals leaks. Pressure reveals leaks. I used to be in the United States Coast Guard. And when I was in the Coast Guard, one of the things I was responsible for was a magazine sprinkler system, an overhead sprinkler system that would put out a fire in a particular space in the ship. And with this magazine sprinkler system, once a quarter, we would do something called a pressure test. A pressure test. Simply, we would pressurize this system in order to see if it had any leaks. Because there's always some leaks hiding somewhere, and they're very hard to see when it's not under pressure. In fact, they can be invisible. But as soon as that pressure comes on, you can see them just so easily. They start to leak. And We've been through seven different kinds of pressure in the last year, and that pressure has exposed some leaks in our lives, and maybe some of your leaks have been exposed. Today, we're going to talk about the pressure of pain, the pressure of pain. We're going to take a look at a story in the Bible about Peter and what pressure and the pressure of pain exposed in him. Have you ever been through the pressure of pain? Uh, Have you been through the pressure of of loss, or uh, the pressure of defeat, or the pressure of shame, or embarrassment, or worry. I think this past year that we've lived through has produced a lot of that pressure for many of us. And we've all endured so much. There were good moments, and there were bad ones. Collectively, we've lost a lot. I know that in the last year, I have felt defeated. I felt defeated. Maybe you have too. Maybe you felt abandoned. Maybe you felt forgotten. I know there's been times when I felt like my prayers were just bouncing off a wall in an empty room. Maybe you've been there too. And when that happened, how did you respond? What did it produce in you? I want to share a familiar story with you today. It's the story of Peter, uh, Peter the apostle, at his lowest point. If you're new to the Bible, Peter was one of the 12 apostles that followed Jesus during his three-year ministry. He would go on to be a founder of the church uh, the way that you and I know it today. He would really start the, the form and the order and the format of worship that we still follow to this day. But Peter's story wasn't always a story of victory and success. Peter was always the most outspoken disciple of Jesus. He was always asking the question that everybody else was afraid to. Uh, He was the one who was quick to act all the time. He saw Jesus walking on water in the middle of the night one night, and Peter just gets out of the boat like Forrest Gump when he sees Lieutenant Dan. He just got out of the boat and started walking to Jesus, and then he sank a little bit, and Jesus pulled him up out of the water and said, Come on, Peter, you had it. Peter had seen Jesus glorified and shining in a moment called the transfiguration. It's this day depicted in the Gospels where Jesus went somewhere private and entered into his glorified body. The way that he looks now, Peter saw him then. And Jesus in his glorified body spoke with Moses and Elijah in one place, in this private place. And Peter was there and he actually saw it. Peter was the first of the disciples to say out loud that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. And Jesus honored him for that. Peter was there standing with Jesus the day that Jesus resurrected a man who had been dead for four days. Peter watched this man walk out of a grave. He sat with Jesus at the table at the Last Supper In fact, before that meal, Jesus washed the disciples' feet and gave them an object lesson in humility and servanthood. But Peter, being Peter, argued and refused to let Jesus wash his feet. And then when Jesus told him that he had to in order to be a part of what Jesus was doing, Peter said, well, then wash my whole body then, Jesus. Wash all of me. And Jesus said, Peter, don't be weird. Quit quit being strange. He said, Peter, chill out a little bit. I'm just going to wash your feet. That's the JMT, the John Mark translation. Peter sat at the table with Jesus as Jesus predicted his death over and over again, predicted his resurrection over and over again. He saw Jesus say that somebody at the table would betray him, and he watched as Judas got up and left the room. 
that night, they went to the garden so that Jesus could pray. And Peter sat just a few feet away from Jesus as Jesus wept aloud in prayer, so intense that he began to sweat drops of blood. And Peter kept falling asleep. But Jesus kept coming over and waking him up again, clearly distraught, clearly going through something, clearly in anticipation of something. And then he saw Judas betray Jesus. And he fought to protect Jesus, but he ultimately ended up watching as his Messiah, his Lord, his hope was led away in chains. And that's where we pick up the story today in Luke chapter 22, verse 54. It says, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him, but he denied it saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly, this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't even know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Wow. Take this moment into the context of all that I just told you. All that Peter had experienced, all he had seen, all he had even said. He had just told Jesus that he would follow him to the grave. And Jesus said, no, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Here he was lying about even knowing Jesus to a little girl within view of Jesus being interrogated. Peter had some leaks. And under the pressure of this terrible night, those leaks were exposed. Maybe you've been through a bad night. Maybe you've been through a bad week or a bad month or a bad year. Maybe you've been there when things took an unexpected downward turn. Maybe like Peter, you forgot some important things. Some important things in that moment. Under pressure, Peter forgets every miracle. He forgets every miracle. Peter had watched Jesus raise a man from the dead just a few days earlier. And now Peter is afraid of death. Peter had seen Jesus in his resurrected glory at the transfiguration. And now he's denying that he even knows him. Peter had seen Jesus walk on water. Peter had walked on water because of Jesus. He had seen a man's lifeless daughter get up and walk again. He had seen his own mother-in-law healed by Jesus. And after all of that, he still denied that he even knew him for fear of what might happen to him. And we do the same thing, don't we? We do it too. Does pressure ever cause your faith to wither the way that it does here for Peter? Maybe you've seen God provide for you in miraculous ways. Maybe you've been healed or you were provided for in a season when you didn't expect to be. Maybe you've seen something move from a dream to reality. If you follow Jesus, I know that at least you've seen him take you from death to life. And yet, as soon as a trial comes our way, we tend to forget all of it. We forget every miracle and we forget every declaration. We forget every declaration. Jesus told Peter that all of this would happen. Mark 8, 31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, this is Jesus teaching the disciples, it says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must, that's what Jesus would refer to himself as sometimes. It comes from a prophecy. Uh, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. 
That just seems pretty clear to me. It seems like Jesus was being pretty frank about the whole thing, like he was pretty upfront about what was going to happen. And even as he was going into Jerusalem, he was making comments or, or being even direct with his disciples. No, this is it. We're going into Jerusalem so that I can be turned over to the high priests. And he was telling them these things and they're just not getting it. They're not understanding it. He stood in front of the temple and he said that this temple will be torn down and in three days... I'll rebuild it. And everyone around him thinks that he's talking about the physical temple. But the disciples have the context to understand that Jesus was talking about himself. They should have, but they didn't. At the Last Supper, over and over again, Jesus says, I am leaving you soon. He was doing everything he could to prepare them for this moment. He was declaring that this would happen, and yet they still didn't get it. You see, Peter should have been prepared for the pressure that he encountered, but he wasn't. And we do the same exact thing. Jesus told us that in this world, we would have trouble. He tells us that we'll be persecuted. He tells us we'll have to lay our lives down for him. And yet when a sacrifice is required of us, we act like it's the end of the world. When we're persecuted, we're shocked and hurt by it. Think that shouldn't be happening. When we have to lay down anything that matters to us, when our opinions aren't heard, when we feel powerless to change people's minds or behavior, when things don't go our way, we are shocked, surprised, and we get hurt. And we also forget every promise. We forget every promise that's been made. When Peter declared that Jesus was the Son of God and the Messiah, Jesus looked at him and said in Matthew 16, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Can you imagine sitting down next to physical Jesus, Jesus in the flesh, Jesus on the same rock that you're sitting on, Can you imagine sitting next to Jesus and he looks you in the eye and he makes this statement. I'm going to use you to build my church and the powers of hell won't be able to stop you. And then can you imagine just forgetting that and acting like you never met him the moment that the pressure is on and things don't go the way you expect them to. But we do the same thing, don't we? We do this too. God has made us some pretty incredible promises, but instead of standing on the truth of those promises, we stand in the lies of our circumstances. That'll preach. Somebody said amen just now. And forgetting every miracle and every declaration and every promise leads to our weaknesses being exposed through sin. This is how it always works. We go down this pathway where we forget what God says about us, what he's promised us, what he's told us to prepare for, where we forget what we've seen him done. And the pressure keeps coming and the pain keeps coming and and the confusion and the loss and all of it keeps piling on. And eventually we crack under that pressure and our weaknesses begin to reveal sin. Peter lashed out at people. He cut one of the guards' ears off. Jesus had spoken about peace and care and loving his enemies over and over and over again. But in this moment, Peter cuts one of the guards' ears off only to have Jesus pick the ear up, put it back on the guard's head, heal him, and then chastise Peter for using his sword. I wonder if a season of pain or loss or stress has ever led you to lash out at somebody who didn't deserve it. I wonder if you've ever lashed out at someone who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. That poor grocery store worker, that poor guy in traffic in front of you, that poor person who just had no idea what they were about to step into. Peter falls back to his old patterns. He's brash, afraid, and self-reliant. He even eventually goes back to fishing the career that he had before he followed Jesus. Have you ever done that? Fallen back into relationships that you know are no good for you because it's convenient in the season that you're in. Fallen back into addiction or sin because it offers some sort of a temporary relief followed by lasting shame and regret. 
Peter falls back into his old ways and then Peter gives up. He's ready to throw in the towel. Even though Jesus has prepared him for this for three years, just like that under this season of pressure, he's ready to give up. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you are just, maybe you're just ready to throw in the towel today. Maybe you're ready to give up. Maybe you have given up. Maybe you're done. You just, you've already moved on. Well, Peter's story doesn't end here. And that's so important for us to understand I need you to hear me say today that your story doesn't need to end here. It doesn't need to end on the mistake. It doesn't need to end on the weakness, on the leak, on the area that the pressure has broken in you. Your story doesn't have to stop right there. It can keep on going just as it did for Peter. In John's gospel, something wonderful happens. Jesus does for Peter what he's willing to do for you right now in this moment. He redeems him. He forgives him. He sets him back on his original purpose. Three times Peter denied Jesus and three times Jesus gives him the opportunity to declare his devotion for him. He redeems him at every moment that he made a mistake. Every sin, every mistake, every denial, Jesus gives him an opportunity at redemption. And Then after Peter's done it, Jesus gave Peter his calling. He said, feed my sheep. And that's what Peter does. He would go on from these moments to start up what we call the church, to lead it, to do miracles, to be bold, to stand up when he needed to stand up and to proclaim the name of Jesus to anybody who would be willing to listen. And he goes through trial and tribulation all the way up to the moment of his death at the hands of the Roman government. But he never denies Jesus again. So if you've already gone down the same road as Peter, and you've forgotten these things in your moment of pain, you've forgotten what he's done, you've forgotten what he's said to you, you've forgotten the miracles in your life, he's ready right now to redeem you the same way that he redeemed Peter. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You don't have to be in darkness for one more minute, for one more day. You can enter into the kingdom of his beloved son who redeems you, who forgives you, who casts your sins as far as the east is from the west. Whatever darkness you've allowed into your life in the last year, you can be delivered from it. You can be free from it. You can find freedom and instead you can enter into the kingdom of God and experience the forgiveness of your sins. That's good news. And for the coming storms, instead of forgetting the things that he has said and done, let's remember what we've seen. Remember what you've seen. If you follow Jesus, you can recall miracles in your life because it's who he is. He's a miracle worker. He heals. He delivers. He restores. Don't ever forget what he's done for you and always believe that he can do it again. I love this story in Joshua chapter 4. The people of Israel had been led to the promised land and Joshua was to lead them across the Jordan and into what God had for them next. But the Jordan River was in its flood stage. The waters were great. And the people of God, even though they had uh, uh, in their past had crossed the Red Sea when Moses led them out of Egypt, and they'd seen the incredible things God could do, now they were at another hardship and they had forgotten all of it. Mikey shared the story in the first message of this series of what happened just before this. They sent spies into the land and the spies came back afraid saying, we need to get back to the desert. We need to go back to Egypt. It's not even worth it. And now here they are about to cross this river and into this land. And and this river is an obstacle. And so God does again what he did with Moses through Joshua. He parts the Jordan River, this giant, mighty, raging, flooded river. God lets them cross on dry land. He stops it upstream and they can cross on dry land. And this is in Joshua chapter 4 verse 4. It says, Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. 
And each one of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. And in the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Maybe you need to be setting up some stones in your life. Maybe it's time for you to set up some memorials in your life. Maybe you need one to remind you of every miracle that God has already done for you along the way. Maybe to keep you from forgetting what God has done for you the next time you hit a season of pressure, the next time you hit a season of pain. You need to set up some reminders that you can physically see. I keep a daily journal in a a spiral notebook. It is wide ruled because I want to feel like I've done more than I really have. It's usually just a couple of sentences and I'll write down what I call the heart of my prayer every day, what I felt God speak in that day. Just usually just a few words. It's not complicated. It, It blesses me. I think that would bless you too if you did it. If you don't journal, I'm telling you, it will take your spiritual life to the next level. It only requires a little bit and it gives you a lot. Now that is my daily journal, but I also have another one. It's leather bound. It smells nice. It's fancy. It's got like a big rope to tie around it. It's cool. And inside that journal, what I do is I record the miracles in my life, the wins, the things that don't make any sense that had to be God. I write my biggest wins and my biggest losses, the hardest days, the times I want to quit, the moments when I can't see God. And you know what happens? Usually at the end of every one of those losses, there's another paragraph about the way God came through. And this book is my stack of stones. I can't tell you how often I've had to go back and look through it and be reminded that God is for me, that he is with me, that he has called me to this, that he has brought me this far, that he's already done things that I never knew were possible in my life. And and I know that he'll do it again. I love the idea of leaving a legacy of the victories God's won in my life for my children. That one day my children will be able to look through that book and say, what do these stones mean? And I can tell them, this is when God parted the sea for us. This is when God showed up and did a miracle that we never expected, that we didn't deserve what he saw us through. And you know what? He'll do it for you too. Never forget what you've already seen. And remember what he said. Remember, instead of forgetting in our seasons of pressure, let's remember what he said. In a season of pain, we begin to process a whole lot of lies through our minds. We believe this is the worst it could be. We believe there's no way out. We believe that tomorrow will never come. We believe it's over. We believe it's our fault. We believe the only way out of this is to compromise our integrity. That the only way forward is to lie. We believe sin will make us feel better. But he said that in this world, we will have trouble. But take heart, for he has overcome the world. He said that he has gone to prepare a place for us. That one day we would be with him in paradise. He said that he casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. That he forgives us of our sins and absolves us of our guilt. I think we need to make it a practice to replace the lies in our head with the truth from God's word. That's a lot easier when you know his word because you read it every day. I have a Bible plan that I love. It's called the Bible in One Year app. The Bible in One Year app. And the, the logo is like red and white. And it's by Nicky Gumbel, who's from a church in England. And so he uses English illustrations sometimes, which I don't understand. They call cookies biscuits. Doesn't make any sense, okay? But I love this study. I read it every day. And because of that, I know God's word. I'm treasuring it and keeping it in my heart. And you can do this too. You can download that app or you could go to the YouVersion Bible app and find one of the many plans there. You can go to the bookstore, pick one that's made out of paper. They still print them. I read one this week and I'll keep it close to my heart in moments of battle. Psalm chapter 20, verse six through nine, it says this. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we don't trust 
We don't trust in anything that we can build. We don't trust in our own power. We don't trust in our ability to get through it. We don't trust in what we know we can do. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Let Lord give victory to the king and answer us when we call. Never forget what he said to you. Let it encourage you and keep you strong in every season of pressure. And finally, remember his promises. Remember his promises. Because he said so much to prepare you for this season, right? His declarations are the things that he has said, the, the, the reminders that we would be persecuted, the reminders that we would encounter troubles in this world. We shouldn't be surprised by those things. We should be prepared for them because he told us they were coming. Just as he told the disciples that he would be turned over to the chief priests and that he would be crucified and resurrected on the third day and they should have been prepared for that we should also be prepared for our times of trouble and so his declarations should remind us of that the things he said should prepare us for that but we also have promises to lean on we have the promises of God to hold us together to prepare us he hasn't just said things to encourage us and guide us as we go through seasons of pressure he's made promises and you can rest in confidence that what God promises he always follows through on he said in Isaiah 41 10 do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you and I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand you don't have to do this on your own you don't have to go through it on your own he will help you he will strengthen you when you can't do it anymore, he'll hold you up with his righteous right hand. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel pretty invincible. To know that even in my weakest moments and in my seasons of real trial where things feel like they're falling apart, that the one who created the universe says that he will hold me up with his right hand and give me strength when I can't walk on my own anymore. In Deuteronomy 31, 8, it says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You are not alone no matter how alone you feel. Your enemy wants nothing more than to isolate you and to make you feel alone. Listen to me. You are not alone alone. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That is a promise. Honestly, this is one of the reasons I think it's so important to be surrounded by the people of God. Because oftentimes when we can't feel the presence of God in our isolation, all it takes is getting around the people of God into a moment of worship and we can see him again. It's one of the important roles of being able to worship together on Sundays. Psalm 37, 23 and 24 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. It makes me think about my little two and a, almost three-year-old daughter. How when we're walking on uneven ground, she may stumble, she may trip, she's likely to, to wobble a little bit, but I'm going to be right next to her, ready to catch her when she starts to go down. He is with you along the way. And then there's this all-time favorite, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Peter spent the rest of his life living in these promises, standing firm when things got difficult, standing up to pressure. If you've seen pressure reveal weaknesses in your life, just remember that in good seasons and in hard ones, you don't have to go through it alone. There is another day coming. And the God who saw you through the last season of pain will see you through this one as well. He's with you. He is for you. He cares about you. And if we will do everything that we can to lean into our relationship with him, he will not let us down. If you're here today and you're watching and you have, you've never... Uh, been in a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're living in that place in between where Peter was, in between the moment where he denied uh, knowing Jesus and when Jesus redeemed him. Maybe you're in that spot in between and you feel absolutely broken. 
You feel like you don't deserve this. Like, why would God want a relationship with you? Why would he, why would he care about you? I need you to know that he thought you were worth dying for. That you are worthy of his love. You are, he has made you worthy. He has declared you righteous. He has given everything you will ever need to be made whole again. All you have to do is just say yes to the gift that he's offered you to step into the relationship that he has prepared for you. And if that's you today, then would you say this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I give myself to you. I worship you with all that I am. Today, I ask that you forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me. And I give all that I am to you. I worship you. And from this day forward, I am yours. I believe in everything you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.